as we know it is over. I think the one thing we can all agree upon, especially over the past week or two, we've all had the sense that life as we knew it before COVID, what we did day to day, how society functioned, how people interacted with one another, the things we fought for and were mindful of, and even how we showed love and appreciation to one another, all of it is gone. We are never going to be able to go back to the way that things were before. And much like how 9-11 left a permanent mark on our society, I believe the coronavirus pandemic will do the same. The death toll alone is something that's incredibly hard to stomach, and the fact that we already have the most confirmed cases of COVID in the world, and we're still at the very beginning of the outbreak in this country. The fact that our government still continues to stall and downplay the dire need for beds, masks, emergency tests, sick pay for affected workers, etc. The fact that Trump refuses to implement any sort of serious containment procedures, and the fact that America has none of the social safety nets or even the type of universal health care that every other developed country in the world has. Your mind wanders to some pretty dark places imagining the sorts of of ramifications this is going to have for us, not just for the rest of the year, but for the next few years or even decades after this. It doesn't help that the government is taking advantage of this crisis in order to increase surveillance and record keeping on civilians under the guise of studying and slowing the spread of the virus. And Edward Snowden himself warns that this uptick in monitoring likely won't stop once this crisis is over. Protests against the fossil fuel industry and environmentally destructive pipelines are being criminalized while hospitals are outright firing health workers, our most vital resource right now, because they dared to speak up about the lack of gear and the horrific mismanagement happening right now in our hospitals before the brunt of the outbreak has even hit us. Money is power, and power, much like capitalism, corrupts and dehumanizes. The mafia-like corporates as politicians who have implanted themselves within this system while doing all they can to uphold it. They're not going to be swayed by the voices of millions of people all calling for their heads. They have intentionally bent and rewritten the law so that it shields them from any and all repercussions, encourages reckless consumption and greed if it aids them, and punishes those who have neither wealth nor power. A system based on endless exponential growth has an inevitable end. It is wholly unsustainable. And we now sit at a crossroads in our history where, regardless of what happens next, everything is going to change. Even though what's happening is truly horrific, my hope is that the shock that we're all experiencing will lead to an awakening and a realization of how we got to this point in the first place, why the current state of things is no longer acceptable, and why we must burn this system to the grounds and rebuild it from the ground up. In this country, Pieces of paper with the faces of dead presidents are more valuable of a currency than actual human blood, which makes sense because capitalism itself is a death cult. As we speak, infected Americans are being forced to choose between going bankrupt from medical debt and dying of a treatable sickness. Even though millions have been laid off and likely won't have a source of income for months, landlords are still demanding payment and threatening to evict vulnerable people, even though civil courts won't be open for months. CEOs refuse to give any protections to their workers who have been put in harm's way while they rake in record profits from the desperate masses who are just trying to find the essentials. All the while, workers who protest and rally others together in order to strike and demand they are given the same treatment that workers around the world receive are fired and left with nothing. Capitalism encourages this type of behavior and leads to a willingness among the ruling class to actively sacrifice the common people or even themselves if it means preserving the wealth and power that they accumulated through abusive and sociopathic exploitation. But the stock market is too precious to allow any of those pesky human lives to get in the way, right? Modern workers really are just a different type of slave. And I found an anonymous quote that explains how. We want slaves without having to feed them, without clothing them, 
without providing shelter for them, without giving them health care, without educating them. We want them to provide these things for themselves, but be powerless and voiceless. And we can't call them slaves because that word causes a big negative reaction. We need a different name for them. Ensnare, exploit, and destroy innocent lives. Destroy the planet, but as long as your exclusive little club gets this just desserts, everyone else can just fuck off. If your priority is profit motive, you're going to be focused on your own selfishness and you will only think of the short term. But if your priority is people, you will be focused on them and make decisions for the years and years to come. We're told that this is the way that this is just how things are, that this is normal, that some people just deserve more and that's that, that they earned their billions rather than stealing it off the backs of workers. Except it's all facade meant to perpetuate class warfare, something that Karl Marx went into great detail about in his writings. He believed that wage slavery restricted their freedom and he wanted workers to unite, strike, and or unionize and run the businesses themselves. That way they could all be prosperous from each according to their ability to each according to their need. So everyone should be treated fairly, humanely, and given equal opportunity in life, happiness, health, safety. Simple enough. We should all be able to relate to that, right? And yet, the objective truth about what society should look like looks very different to us than it does to the state. In his Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, Karl Marx presented the theory of alienation in which he argued that workers become estranged from their humanity as a consequence of living in a society in which capitalism is a mode of production and that an individual loses the ability to determine his or her own life and destiny. We're told that the key to a successful life is to compete with those around you and throw them under the bus if necessary, if it means that you get to have a leg up. We are a communal species by our very nature, but you're told that fighting against those instincts is the only path to a happy life. That enriching yourself is more important than lending aid to your neighbor. Isn't it fascinating that even though money and the economy were concepts that we created and hold no intrinsic value or meaning outside of us, much like the gods of modern religions, people are still willing to die and kill for it. This thing that means nothing. Even though society could still exist and flourish without it, millions absolutely refuse to let go. They've been brainwashed into believing that the pursuit of profit is the only thing that matters. It's why competitiveness and sociopathy are ingrained into so many, even at an early age, and they're intentionally insulated from the rest of the world. But look outside our bubble and you'll hear the stories about countries like Venezuela, El Salvador, Vietnam, and many others who have passed legislation to freeze rent and mortgages for up to six months to give workers sick pay so they're able to stay home and protect themselves from COVID, but not have to worry about losing their livelihood. And these countries are many, many times poorer than the US, but they're still able to provide all of these things that our government likes to call impossible and or socialism. They don't want you to know about the history of people's uprisings, how well taken care of citizens are in other countries around the world, and how shoddy just about every single area of our country is in comparison. They don't want you to know about democratically elected socialist and communist leaders who were overthrown and or killed by the American government, or the hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians that we've killed in the Middle East and around the world all at the order of the military industrial complex. They've tried to erase the fact that indigenous peoples were the original anarchists and intentionally downplay the power of unionizing and solidarity amongst the proletariat. Again, they must keep you blind in order to keep you down. Education under capitalism is intentionally insufficient in order to keep the populace uninformed and passive. And much like how we're isolated from others around the world, we're still highly segmented at home and intentionally kept out of arm's reach of one another. We're told that the reason for our suffering is those who look different than the supposed ethnic majority or think differently than the supposed ideological majority 
of the country they live in. The state tells us that some people's needs simply can't be accommodated for and that they either need to assimilate, quiet down, or disappear. We're told that privilege doesn't exist, but watch as doors are flung open left and right for those who are white, cis, straight, typically male, and willing to bend to the will of the bourgeois. That's the key. While barriers within every single level of society are put in front of people of color, women, indigenous peoples, the LGBTQ and disabled communities, neurodivergent people, or the people more likely to resist the status quo and the bourgeois, that act as a boot to our face every time we reach for the next rung on the ladder that is our societal hierarchy. We're told that these hierarchies are normal, except they aren't. Rooted into every single corner of American society are systems of oppression that seek to control and subjugate people and stratify society. Capitalism, racism and white supremacy, sexism, ableism, religion, homophobia and transphobia, classism, privilege, imperialism, colonialism, the erasure or delegitimization of certain people's experiences, union busting, the criminalization of socialism and communism in the U.S., the assassination of beloved revolutionary figures like MLK and the Black Panthers. All of these are weaponized against vulnerable communities to ensure that they never have the collective power to fight back and at last overthrow the source behind all of it. And it's a difficult fight we're currently facing because our capitalist society is like a hydra cut off one head and two more will appear in its place. All the while it wraps itself around you and squeezes harder and harder until, in many cases, you die. Our oppressors will stop at nothing to eliminate whoever or whatever would seek to expose them for what they are. We have to uproot everything from the bottom up, tear all of it out and burn it. The only thing that is going to free us is if the structure that's currently in place no longer exists. Either we put the stake through the heart of capitalism or it does the same to us. And I don't plan on dying anytime soon. Mark Yu Kling very eloquently said, Capitalism is a machine that eats people and shits gold. One can only hope the people profiting off of this machine will one day be battered to death by the hunks of gold falling down upon them. Nothing else will work. The vast majority of humanity just wants to live and exist, but we are being held down by all of these oppressive systems. How these systems affect everyone is different, but we share that common struggle. Despite this, however, there are vast swaths of the population that have been scared away from the terms socialism, communism, and anarchism because of conservative and even neoliberal entities crafting a modern-day Pavlov's test meant to cause an immediate negative reaction of fear and or disgust every time they hear those words. I've had numerous conversations in which someone would yell, uh, Venezuela, Cuba, uh, China? After me mentioning that implementing Medicare for all would be good, because saying, hey, other countries have better healthcare systems than ours, maybe we should take notes from them? Apparently that's bad. <laughs> You're going to be working against deeply ingrained beliefs that they don't realize are the result of indoctrination rather than genuine truth. They likely won't realize that they are actively upholding systems of oppression through their words, actions, and attitudes or treatment of others. Those who have been seduced by fascistic thinking may see a questioning of their beliefs as a betrayal of some unforeseen legacy or a slandering of the leader whom they hold very dear. And many also suffer from a Gatter Damerung effect, or the belief that they'd rather have the world go down in flames than change their lifestyle and admit that they are wrong. The moment they feel the foundation of their beliefs beginning to crumble, their immediate reaction is to cling to religion, propaganda, and thoughts that were implanted in them by the state and external forces over time that convinced them that the solution to their problems, as well as the problems within society, lie with them others 
instead of within them. Those who are genuinely racist, nationalistic, white supremacists, so those who are more on the fringes of the alt-right or who have already fallen deep within it, as well as far-right evangelicals will be significantly harder to reach if they even choose to listen to you. What matters is that you leave your hand extended and you don't forcibly try to change their beliefs. Only they can do that. But it is a beautiful thing when someone from one of these aforementioned belief systems opens themselves to the reality of the system they're currently in. They willingly criticize it even though the hegemonic societal and political norms of America would push them to do the opposite. And it's even better when they listen to the words of those who have studied theory, who have studied history, and understand the ins and outs of this system and why it's harmful and they at last look at all the ways in which reality contradicts the beliefs that they thought were indisputable truth. In my mind, the best approach to advocating for leftist ideologies is to open a dialogue, seek to educate and teach them how to think, but not what to think. Find connections between communist and anarchist theory and their everyday experiences and go from there. Dismantle all of the myths about America and capitalism that our government has broadcast for decades. Be an ally to the marginalized, boost their voices instead of speaking for them, and encourage those whom you've opened a dialogue with to go do the same with others. All it takes is one seed planted in someone's mind to start something great. When most of us imagine the idea of transitioning to a post-capitalist society, it's a bit intimidating just because we are looking at a complete transformation of what we currently know as America. And this is something that's pretty far outside a lot of people's socio-political understanding. But we've all felt frustration and disillusionment over how completely broken this society has become. And the vast majority of us already long for a world in which we'd all have equal footing, we wouldn't have to scrape by, we could flourish and do whatever it is that brings us meaning, all while living in a truly communal manner, just like our ancestors did. So how do we lay the foundation for such a society? You could fill stacks and stacks of books with speculation over this, but I want to give what I see as a few key ideas. British journalist and writer Paul Mason, in his book Post-Capitalism, A Guide to Our Future, lays out what he believes are the guiding principles to successfully transitioning away from capitalism, and they are understanding the limitations of human willpower in the face of a complex and fragile system, and testing all proposals at a small scale, and model their macroeconomic impact virtually many times before attempting them on a large scale, ecological sustainability, and the democratic control of all of Earth's resources. The transition is not just about economics, it needs to be a human transition where people will see their lives improve meaningfully. Solutions should be looked for through a mixture of small-scale experiments, proven models that can be scaled up, and top-down actions by states. And we must maximize the power of information to decentralize economic control. We should nationalize our industries, break up and abolish big banks and corporate monopolies, and do away with the beloved free markets. Democratize the economy, redistribute resources to end poverty and hunger, erase all debt, and do away with private property. Once all of this is accomplished, we should strip money of all of its power and meaning and render it completely useless. Anthony Signorelli, in an article for the post-capitalist future, said, what good is it to have all the money in the world when everything is free and nothing can be purchased anyways? It isn't the capitalists that will lose their money. Their problem will be that the capital they accumulated will become increasingly meaningless. It will provide for them decreasing levels of power and influence. Sever the roots of what gives them their power and we will see how truly powerless they are without it. Wait, wait what's that? Um, Alice, if they're still in positions of power, can't they still weaponize the legislative branch, the electoral college, police state, or even the power of the president themselves against us? Good point. This is why the entire electoral system must be dismantled. No electoral college, no more Citizens United, no more allowing CEOs and corporations to engage in backroom deals with politicians, no more allowing others to choose for us, no more throwing our votes in the fire and giving us the finger. Our government should be structured so that its halls and seats 
should it even remotely resemble what we see today, be filled with people like us. Those who actually understand what the vast majority of us experience and need, and those who are willing to fight for us and no one else, the hierarchy of government itself should be done away with so that way direct democracy finally becomes a reality. All power in society should be placed back in our hands so that nothing is ever again out of our control. Only we should determine how society is run, and only we should be writing the laws. Wage slavery should be abolished, and we should be able to pursue whatever work fulfills us rather than having to work to survive. Education should be free and based on facts, not propaganda, and critical thinking should be instilled from an early age. Housing and healthcare should be basic human rights, and society as a whole should be built on communal structures so that way it truly works for all of us. No more predatory practices. No more ripping control out of the hands of those who need it most. No more refusing to give a platform to a wide variety of faces and voices. No more attacking efforts by the collective to take care of one another. No more money, managers, landlords, gatekeepers. No leaders, no followers, no gods, no masters. Detractors will try to delegitimize our movement by calling it a utopia and a pipe dream that'll never happen because human nature or something? But in reality, it is just a practical solution to the issues that every single one of us face. Oppression will always exist in one form or another, but at the very least, we should restructure society in order to more effectively fight and discourage it. A revolution by the people for the people. Revolutions, or the successful ones anyways, didn't start with a gunshot. They were birthed when one person saw the injustices in their country and they decided to speak up. Their words and ideas lit fires within those around them and that fire spread until the entire populace was alight together and united in the greatest fight of their lifetimes a fight for true freedom for everyone. Remember, even when the Black Plague was at its peak in the mid-1300s, peasants around Europe rose up and at last overthrew serfdom. 60% of Europe's population had been wiped out, but it didn't stop them from doing what needed to be done. Standing and fighting together in solidarity to free themselves from the shackles of an oppressive system that had for too long spat in their faces and dragged them through the mud. They had enough, they rose up, and they still successfully overthrew their masters against the most overwhelming odds. We can do the same. No struggle worth fighting for will ever be an easy one, but it will be worth it. Onwards and upwards, together we move forward. Cheers to our future. And that is gonna do it for the video this week. If y'all enjoyed, be sure to leave a like below. If you wanna see more from me, hit that subscribe button, ring the bell, so you will be notified for all of my future content. Next week in part four of this COVID series, we're going to go into how an anarchist society would not only look, but also how it would address the pandemic, how it would help marginalize communities, and how it would truly be an ideal society for every one of us. But until then, take care of one another, give love to everyone you can, be sure to remind everyone that we are not alone even though we are in isolation, and that no matter how awful and oppressive these external forces seem, we are going to get through it together. I love y'all, hang in there, I'm right there with you. We're gonna get through this together and I will see you